All right, honest, honest question. How many of you have had this hymn stuck in your heads for a couple weeks now? Anyone? Anyway, I see a couple hands. Uh, I was driving along and last week just do, 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 and I went, oh, Pastor Ivo was right. It is in my head. It's in my head. And I had to look it up and listen to it a few times more. Um, but there's a reason for that. We've, we've had the past couple weeks, this sermon series is really based out of scripture and out of this hymn, because this hymn really speaks to the mission. And we started with the crux, right? What it all comes down to, the crucial part, which is the cross. It's the cross. Is the, the cross is the crux of the matter, what it all comes down to. And then last week, we heard Pastor Eibel uh, preach about the light with that candle, that verse about the candle. And it's not, um, it's not to be shunned, right? And we reflect the light of Jesus. So there are lots of us who would like to uh, scream and curse the darkness. You stupid darkness. I love that cartoon analogy. Um, but really, we're called to be who we are as light, reflecting that light of Jesus. And today, we continue with this hymn, but looking at that refrain, at the chorus, which says, to love the Lord our God is the heartbeat of our mission, the spring from which our service overflows across the street or around the world. The mission's still the same. Proclaim and live the truth in Jesus' name. To love the Lord our God is the heartbeat of this mission. The heartbeat of this mission. Paul gets into that point in the text for today. We're going to be working out of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. If you'd like to open your Bible to that, it's on page 159 in the New Testament if you're using one of the pew editions. And uh, so Paul's been writing to the Corinthians. He's been working with those in Corinth. And just for a little bit of context or background of where Paul is at this moment, um, in his life at this moment, when he's writing these letters to the Corinthians, he's being charged for being out of his mind. He's being accused of being an insane fanatic in his proclamation of Jesus. How many of us are accused of being insane fanatics? Okay, all right, honest confession there. <laughs> so that's where Paul is. He is being charged um, and accused of being this crazy fanatic in his proclamation. But we see why, where he writes in verse 14, the first part, he says, for the love of Christ urges us on and urge here, that word urge, it means to control or to compel. It means to hold in one's grip. So the love of Christ is controlling or gripping Paul so that it controls all of his actions. The love of Christ compels him in the words that he speaks. The love of Christ urges us on, and he writes on, because we are convinced that one has died for all. Now, this is a substitutionary atonement statement. Big words. Substitutionary atonement. What that means is that the for in this statement, we are convinced that one has died for all. That for in this statement means on behalf of or in place of. So what did someone have to die in place of or on behalf of for all? Someone needed to die to pay for God's wrath. God has wrath for sin, for evil, and it requires to bring it to justice, to bring it to order. It requires a death. It requires a death and Jesus took on that wrath, and he died in our place. Good Friday. Any of you uh, might remember the Good Friday sermon this, this past uh, spring. And Pastor Eibel preached about the cup that Jesus drank from. And it wasn't the wine goblet. 
at the Last Supper, and it wasn't a water cup. It was the cup of wrath that was poured out upon him that he took on willingly for us, in place of us, on behalf of us, to pay that price for our sin. He paid the penalty for your sin. He paid the penalty for my sin. In 2 Corinthians, it says, For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. In 1 Timothy, it says, For there is one God, there is also one mediator between God and humankind, Christ Jesus, himself human, who gave himself a ransom for all. Romans 5 says, But God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more surely then, now that we have been justified by his blood, will we be saved through him from the wrath of God. The love of Christ urges us on because we are convinced that one has died for all. And what do those next four words say? Therefore, all have died. When Jesus died, we all died. We were brought in to that death of his. Our sin died on that cross when Jesus died on that cross. That wrath that Jesus took was the wrath that we deserved, and we died to it with him. In Romans, and we all, this should be familiar from our baptismal teachings, in Romans 6 it says, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death. Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. When God looks at us, he does not see the sinner who deserves wrath, he does not see the sinner who deserves death and punishment. He sees Jesus Christ. He sees us through the blood of Jesus, pure and righteous and okay with him, okay to approach the throne, okay to be in his presence through Jesus Christ. When God looks at us, he sees that new person as we are, through Christ. In Galatians 3, it says, For in Christ Jesus you are all children of God through faith. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. We are no longer that blemished sheep. We are no longer scarlet with our sin. We are clothed in Jesus Christ, clothed in his righteousness, to be presented to the Father in that righteous state. In verse 15, as we continue in our reading, it says, And he died for all, so that those who live might live no longer for themselves, but for him who died and was raised for them. In our sinfulness, we're all really tempted to still live for ourselves. Even when we know we shouldn't, we get tempted into taking care of number one, right? I want to live for me. I get tempted by that. In Luke 12, the 12th chapter, I should say, uh, Jesus gives us a great parable of this temptation. He was surrounded by a crowd. And he said to them, take care. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly. And he thought to himself, what should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. So he has this interesting conundrum. He has so much. He is blessed with a bounty of crops, and he doesn't know what to do with it. Let's see what he does. Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones. 
And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night, your life is being demanded of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. That man had an, a choice to make. He had an abundance. He could have fed how many mouths, how many families could he have impacted with the abundance of his crops? But he thought, take care of number one. I'm going to make sure that I have more than I need. I'm going to make sure I'm taking care of me and I'm done. But he was a fool. He was a fool. Our life is not to be characterized by self-love. Instead, we're compelled, right? We're controlled by the love of Christ. The one who loves us controls us, has a grip on our actions, our words. It was not the duty of, it was not out of duty that Paul acted. Rather, it was out of love. To love the Lord our God is the heartbeat of our mission. It's the heart of our mission. For a while now, we've been studying the book of Acts. We've been going through the first seven chapters. We're almost finished with the seventh chapter. Um, but we've really wanted for our congregation to see the early church in mission, to see how they functioned, how they did it in their mission. And there was clear focus with those first disciples. They shared the gospel verbally. They proclaimed salvation in the name of Jesus Christ without ceasing. Even when they were told to stop, they wouldn't. And they were Bold. I think that's an understatement, but it's all I can come up with. They were bold. They were arrested. They were beaten. They were put in jail. They were brought before the council, and they would not stop. I love it when they're standing in front of the Sanhedrin, when they're in that council, and they're being charged, and they're being questioned, and their lives are hanging in the balance, and they're told, you just need to stop. Stop speaking the name of Jesus. And what do they do? Right there to the council. Mm, sorry, we're not going to stop this. We're going to keep on keeping on. And they would go straight back out to the temple and proclaim salvation in the name of Jesus Christ. They would not stop. That, that is bold. And the witness that they brought is the same witness that we bring and we, uh, we've had, we've taken some thought and put some energy into this in, in helping uh, us have that witness, helping us get bold in our witness. We have some special classes. Some of you probably have already participated in some of these, um, and they're geared towards helping us in our witness. The first one is, and these are, don't have to be in any particular order at all. You can jump in at any time. But the first one that we have is Everyday Missionary Course. That's the who. That's showing us who. It's helping us to recognize who is in our mission field. Who do we see every single day that we can be sharing with? That's the who. Everyday missionary. Who? 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 Then we have everyone his witness. That's the how. That's the how. We've had our eyes opened to our mission field. The everyone his witness shows us how to engage with those that are in our mission field. It gives us pointed questions, conversation, some direction in how to engage with those around us and how to share the gospel. Sometimes it can be scary, but if you're scared, we also have everyday boldness, which is do, do it. Just go out and do it. It's all about gaining that confidence in being 
a witness. So we have the who, the how, the do. And right now, Pastor Ibel and I are working on developing an academy to further equip the congregation and those outside the congregation. And the academy will be a series of classes that you can take to help equip you to be a witness, help equip you to grow in your discipleship and to be a bold disciple in this world and to ably and confidently defend the Christian faith. So I get really excited about things. I don't know if any of you have noticed that ever um, about me. Whenever I try to pull a prank on someone, I, I, I always ruin it. I never, I can't wait till the moment where I can say, surprise, you know, someone's coming in for a birthday surprise, I yell before they're in the house, you know, I just, I get really excited about things, so it's been very hard for me to kind of play it cool, so I'm really excited to get to share with you this next bit, because it's just incredible, it's such a neat journey that we're about to take as a congregation, and I can't tell you how blessed we are as a congregation, as brothers and sisters in Christ, as people of God, to take this journey together. In 2019, we're going to see some special ministries emerge, and this is all born out of the faithful giving of this congregation. We have such a generous congregation, and everything that I'm going to tell you now is out of that generosity of this people, which is amazing and so special. Um, in Acts 1, verse 8, it says, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So if you think about that as concentric circles of mission, you have Jerusalem, right? Hometown, home space. Then we go out a little bit to Judea, then a little bit further to Samaria, and then all the way out to the ends of the earth. Well, we've got something for you in each of those mission fields. Some amazing, amazing opportunities. Out of this incredible financial blessing that we have, uh, council and staff got together and we prayed and we talked and we prayed and we talked some more and we prayed some more and we found that out of the blessings that we have, not just financial, but the blessings of time and talent, you guys are an amazing congregation. What a shame to, to waste that because you're incredible people. You are amazing witnesses of Jesus Christ. And as council and staff, we realized that this financial blessing needs to be invested in the people of Living Word Lutheran Church to be sent out as missionaries on special mission opportunities. In Jerusalem, in our own back door, we're beginning a new ministry. It's Kids Beach Club, and this will be at Dove Elementary. It's for third through sixth grade kids. It meets right after school, one hour a day, one day a week, and it's 24 weeks of the school year. And we're gonna build a team of missionaries to go and share the gospel and put a Bible in these kids' hands uh, I heard from one of the uh, volunteers that's worked over there at Dove Elementary, and she said she's had several kids come up to her and tell her, we don't go to church, this is my church. That Thursday afternoon, an hour of hearing the gospel from those volunteers, those missionaries, that's their church. And what an opportunity that we get to share Jesus Christ with these little kids. And maybe we get that opportunity to share Jesus Christ with their parents or grandparents or aunts or uncles. We get to proclaim the name of Jesus Christ in our own Jerusalem. And then we move out to Judea. And we're partnering with a very special ministry called My Father's Business. It's in Chicago. If you've taken Everyday Missionary Course with Steve Burke, this will be familiar to you and you will know how important this ministry is. The goal of the ministry is to get at-risk kids off the street on Friday nights. This ministry feeds the kids. They play basketball or some games. They have a Bible lesson. 
And we're planning on sending a team of four individuals three times a year up to Chicago. They took this ministry, they took one night off and two kids were shot and killed. And they said, never again. We will never not be open on a Friday. And they proclaim the name of Jesus every single week to those kids that need to hear it. We all need to hear it. Samaria, moving out a little bit further in those circles. We're going to work with a Native American ministry in Navajo, New Mexico. This is a nation within our nation, a different culture within our own culture. And we're sending 10 people from this congregation this spring to come alongside Shepherd of the Valley Lutheran Church in reaching the Navajo people with the love of Christ. Shepherd of the Valley was closed five years ago. They didn't have anyone. They didn't have worship. They didn't have Bible studies. They didn't have community activities. It was, for all intents and purposes, a dead church when Pastor Tim Norton was called there. And over the past five years, he has seen 27 people called out of the darkness and into the glorious light through holy baptism. And we get to come alongside them and share in their mission and share the gospel of Jesus Christ and the ends of the earth. We're sending the kids to do that. No, I'm just kidding. We are, <laughs> we are, we are, our youth trips, our, our, C, our junior high youth trip this summer, uh, they're going to Tennessee. Uh, they're going to work with younger kids putting on a VBS type program, and they're going to do work to care for the earth as good stewards of God's creation. And the senior high youth are going up to South Dakota to help a Native American community in construction that will benefit their community. And we're also sending, and this is open for all, this is not just the youth, we're sending 25 missionaries from this congregation back to Costa Rica. It's open to everyone. They were there last summer, we're going again. And they got to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. They got to do home visits and pray with people who didn't know Jesus and didn't know if they wanted to know Jesus. What an exciting opportunity to get back and, and continue to build those relationships with those people and see if those seeds have been planted or continue to plant seeds. The ends of the earth. Who knew it would be Costa Rica? But it is. And it's very, very exciting. Approximately $40,000 of the financial blessing is being used to keep participant costs to a minimum. We have plans to carry this into 2020 as well, making a similar investment next year. So we can, it's not a one and done. We're building these relationships with the Navajo people. We're building these relationships in Costa Rica. We're building these relationships with the kids and families of Dove Creek Elementary. These missions are not just to work with our hands, but to bring that verbal witness of Jesus Christ to the people that we meet. Think back to the book of Acts. All the actions, all the physical happenings that, they, that the disciples were doing brought about the opportunity to verbally proclaim Jesus Christ. Every action afforded the opportunity for that verbal proclamation. The old model of the American church was we, the church, are going to do it, and you, the people, get to help us. But if we look at the book of Acts, if we learn from the book of Acts, which we have, which we do, we see it's flipped. It's actually you, the people, the people of God can do it. We, the church, will equip you and support you and send you. And that is exciting. That's very, very exciting. Luther, Living Word is investing in you because you are the missionaries. You are on a missionary or on a mission. You will be sent out on special mission opportunities. And why? We go right back to our text. For the love of Christ 
urges us on, it compels us, it controls us because we are convinced that one has died for all, therefore all have died, and he died for all so that those who live might live no longer for themselves but for him who died and was raised for them. And so we sing in our chorus, to love the Lord our God is the heartbeat of our mission, the spring from which our service overflows. Across the street or around the world, the mission's still the same. Proclaim and live the truth in Jesus' name. And so we sing, and so we live.